if God just forgives all Christians and none of them go to hell, why would any Christian do good when they can just sin all they want? Why would anyone make the hard moral decisions if they were promised the reward regardless? Hey guys, welcome back to All Things Apologetics. My name is Esther. Today we are going to briefly be responding to those who question the doctrine of grace in Christianity. So I really appreciate the work of um, different Christian apologists who have Muslim backgrounds. I think um, people like Nabil Kreshi, um, who has passed away, but um, and Abdu Murray, they both like really struggled with certain Christian doctrines as Muslims, and they really have some profound insights um, on different issues like the doctrine of grace and mercy and justice. And so I've been reading some and just thinking about doing a short series about responding to some of these common misconceptions that Muslims have about Christianity. And today um, we wanted to dive into this notion of grace. So let's get into this. So I think there are three good points um, when looking at these questions. The first one that I want to explore just briefly is the seriousness of sin. So let's begin with the beginning. Um, God exists as three persons who love each other perfectly. And so out of this love, God created mankind that we also might love God. So in order for this love to be valuable, it must be voluntary. So God gave man the choice to love him or to reject him. When man disobeys God, it is t tantamount to rejecting God. In rejecting the source of life, we bring death upon ourselves. So Romans 3.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So I address the seriousness of sin in another video I will try to link above here. If you want to check it out, it is called What Christianity is Not and the Five Pillars. Um, and I think this is a good place to begin when um, talking to our Muslim friends because the way that Christians see sin is pretty different than the way Muslims see sin. From what I understand, Muslims see sin a, a bit differently. They see it more like um, you are somehow ignorant of the right thing, like you are making a mistake where Christians see it more as an act of rebellion, rejection of God. So it seems that in Islam, the solution to man's problem, this ignorance, is Sharia, knowing and doing the law. Well, if you look at the book of Romans, um, chapter 3 especially, you will see that the, the purpose of the law is to show us that we aren't good, that we cannot um, be perfect as God is perfect. And while I won't get really into the doctrine of original sin in this video, it is important to note that Christians do believe in that while Muslims do not. However, uh, Muslims also do believe that Adam was cast out of the garden. So perhaps that is significant um, if you are going to discuss this issue. So because of Adam's sin, we have all been born broken and prone to sin. We are not judged for his sin, but because of his sin, we all ultimately sin. And this is kind of key, I think, just in talking about salvation in general with Muslims to see, well, what really is a problem before we look at the solution. So in steps Jesus, and Jesus means God saves. And that really is the core of Christian doctrine, that it's not about us somehow trying to be good enough. It's not us trying to outweigh our bad deeds with good deeds, but really it's God, he steps into um, our world and he takes on human flesh. He lives a perfect life that we could not live. And so he does not deserve any punishment for sin as he does not sin, but he can take our sin upon him. So I think where we really see God's mercy, love, and grace is in Jesus. So listen to this passage here. It's Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavens, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And this is a very um, popular verse here because I think it just really explains the gospel message well. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift. Not from works so that no one can boast. And then verse 10 is key here. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. So it's important to note that while we are not saved by doing good works, it's not like we can do enough good works to outdo our sin, our rebellion, when we can't unsin. Um, but we are saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, 
but we are saved for for the purpose of doing good works in Christ Jesus. So if you want to use Aristotelian categories, we can say that the final cause of our salvation is good works. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved for the purpose of those good works. And um, ultimately, we are becoming more and more who we were created to be as we obey God and follow his good and perfect plan for our lives. So one thing that Nabil Kreshi points out in this book here, No God But One, is that the gospel's idea of a heart transformed by God is a foreign concept to Muslims. So here is a passage that I thought maybe would be good to point out to your Muslim friend, um, just so they can really grasp like what it what is happening when you do come to Christ. So this is from 2 Corinthians 5, let's see, I'm going to read chapters 13 through 16. It says here, For if we are out of our mind, it is for God. This is Paul writing, the Apostle Paul. If we have a sound mind, it is for you. This is key here. For Christ's love compels us, since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. From now on, then, we do not know anyone in a purely human way. Even if we have known Christ in a purely human way, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Everything is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. So, anyways, um, if you want to continue reading this passage, 2 Corinthians 5, I highly recommend it. So, as Paul says here, Christ's love compels us to live for God, and we are new creations. The Holy Spirit is working in us, helping us want to live for God. And I think another thing that is also worth mentioning is um, that as Christians, we also see God as a loving father. And so this might be a little bit different than the way maybe your Muslim friend views God. So a perfect father would love his children no matter what he does. And mercy and justice are expressions of God's perfect love. God offers mercy for everyone who has sinned while also demanding justice for every sin ever committed. He does this by offering to bear the consequences of our sins himself. The consequences of our sin is death, and God is willing to die on behalf of all his children. So let's go back to the original question. If God just forgives all Christians and none of them go to hell, why would any Christian do good when they can sin all they want? And here is their response. When the young siblings in Hong Kong asked me their question, I briefly considered the ways I could answer. Sitting down next to them, I nodded toward their mother and asked them a question in return. Do you love your mom? Slightly taken aback, they answered emphatically, of course. Smiling, I asked them a simple question. When she asks you to do something like clean your room, what do you think would make her happier? If you cleaned your room because you love her or if you cleaned your room because you were, were afraid she would punish you? Without hesitation, the sister answered, because we love her. And as the wor words left her lips, the realization was apparent on her face. Obedience under the shadow of threat is hardly obedience at all, but compulsion. Christian obedience, devoid of threat and rooted in love, is what God truly wants. I began to explain to her and her brother that when we respond to the gospel and live as children of God, our Father changes our hearts and makes us want to obey out of love. So I hope this was an encouragement to someone out there. I hope to make some more videos soon on topics like the Trinity and responding to some other common objections made by our Muslim friends. If you have any suggestions or comments, don't hesitate to comment below, and I will see you all next time. God bless. Peace.